open in my cellar back home in Ohio. We'll uh, dive right in. Over the years, acting as a DM, which artifact did you most enjoy introducing during a session, adventure, or campaign? Um, back when I was running campaigns or whatever, I really enjoyed sticking in intelligent swords. Because, of course, they were never obviously intelligent right off the bat. And um, with an intelligent sword that doesn't like who's carrying it, you can fool with die rolls and do all kinds of things. Um, and the players got no clue about what's going on at, at, at the beginning. Now, hopefully you've got a smart player who's going to figure out something's going around and something's going on and what's new. Oh, that's... Anyway... They're a lot of fun. Um, any intelligent weapon is fun, actually, because uh, you can have them just instantaneously take over the player character <laughs> and rush them into battle. Now, I say that, that's usually, you can do that the first time because the player character has no idea what's going on. Having done that once will then... I would certainly allow the player character to try and figure out what's going on and uh, commence a battle of wills with his uh, wayward weapon. There are a lot of you. Oh, you can you can have so much fun with uh, willful weapons. I like to call them. Sir, have you ever run a whodunit storyline in a dungeon scenario? Do you think detective murder murder mystery tropes work in dungeon settings? What are the most important things to remember when running a whodunit, whodunit murder mystery game in or out of a dungeon setting? Thanks for all the great videos. Keep us informed on your Patreon efforts. Well, there's going to be a leak, link in here uh, where you can go and uh, see my Patreon, and I'll talk more about that towards the end. Um, personally, a straight whodunit, eh, play Sherlock Holmes. Now, having said that, if you can wrap a adventure or a series of adventures around solving a mystery, who did this, where did that piece go, etc., etc., you can have a masterful hook for a series of adventures in a campaign setting. Now, um, Having said that, I don't think you should um, disguise that and and lull a bunch of people into playing it only to find out, oh, well, we're playing Clue for grown-ups. Um, when I was with Eldridge, Frank wrote one that was mostly mystery. It didn't sell all that well, and we didn't get a lot of positive feedback on it. One, well, we didn't get any feedback on it to speak of one way or another. So that kind of tells me that maybe that's a dead-end alley to be barking up. Um, however, though, again, um, mysteries can't, m mysterious things, mysterious happenings, um, how, how did this come about type things can be a very uh, important underlying campaign support or even a goal you know finding out how this happened and then okay now we know this let's go to there and we'll figure out you know it can be done but a straight you know who killed cock robin type thing hmm, doesn't doesn't float my boat question have you ever played a battleship game that makes good use of 3d space Maybe a space theme game, or maybe a submarine theme. What are the characteristics of a game making good use of space in that way? Well, I'm, I've certainly never played a battle, a battlefield, a battleship game. Now, when you when you say three dimensional, I mean a battle a battleship is pretty much two dimensional. 
Yeah, you know, what's in the air, what's here. Um, I guess you could shoot torpedoes at it and go underwater. But if you're, if you're talking about three-dimensional space, height, distance, etc., um, I don't know of a, I certainly don't know of a battleship game that's any good at that. I don't play enough sci-fi spaceships type games. The best game I know of, and you're going to think I'm beating that old, poor old dead horse again. The best game I know that has, uh, the three dimension, the best handling of three dimensions how far off the ground, how far away, relatively, you know, relative distance, etc., would be uh, Dawn Patrol, otherwise known as Fight in the Skies. Because there you have uh, degrees of separate, you know, you have feet of separation, distance, relative distance to each other. Um, Yeah, this plane's at this altitude, this plane's at that altitude, the ground's down there. You know, three-dimensional distance away from each other. I, I can't really see anything except a flying-type uh, milieu that would lend itself well to 3D play. However, that being said, I'm not a, I don't play a superhero game. But I do know of one in development where they use the three dimensions uh, because, you know, how high is the dude flying and how far away is he and, you know, whatever. Um, depth, width, height. Really, the, the only game I have any extensive experience with would be Dawn Patrol. Maybe I missed out. If you've got a better game, let me know. Um, it's possible there could be a naval game that involves submarines and surface ships and aircraft. I, I don't. I don't know of one. I know there are some naval games that I've never played. And there's a game called Harpoon that might. Uh, from what little I know of it, it might meet the criteria. All right. Now, this one's an interesting, and this is going to be a purely uh, personal, subjective answer. At what point or level is a wizard able to create life? My prototype for this would be Saruman and Lord of the Rings creating uruk High, but another form might be the magician who enchanted dragon teeth to sprout into warriors from the cast down on the ground or uh, similar. That's the first of this individual's two questions. Um, never would be my first answer. In terms of D&D, &D, to be able to cast a spell you can already animate objects with a very high level spell, giving them perfect per, permanent animation and or a, a soul or an inner driving force or controlling force. Um, seriously, the level ought to be like 140. And that's countless spells not thought of yet in between now and then. If you're a little hinky, squeamish about it um, on, on religious grounds or the, the schooling or the, the catechism classes or the Sunday schools you had growing up, that's okay. Um, creating life is, is, should be, in my opinion, a whole different cosmic level above what any of these PCs are doing. If, and I, re I say if, you were to structure a campaign bad guy because he can pull up these, 
these shambling mounds or, or, you know, mud golems or whatever you want to call them. Okay, make it the bad guy because the bad guy's levels as such are, are immaterial. They're the bad guy. They can do all these things and they're immune to all these other things. And so uh, you're not... Uh, you're not backing yourself into a level corner. But as a rule, no. Um, I mean, good grief. A long, long time ago, I did. I published an article that uh, said that there's nothing in the books that said that Gandalf was anything other, anything bigger, badder than a fifth level magic user. Which by the structure of the original game is a perfectly valid point. Nothing he did couldn't be done by. What we were trying to get people to understand is, my God, if Gandalf is not only a fifth, quit crying about not progressing very fast. Because up to this point in time, Gandalf was the absolute most favoritist, everybody's neatest old guy wizard that could really do good stuff, and after all, he finally defeated a Balrog. Uh, but we don't know how the Balrog was defeated, exactly. We went there to roll the dice and see. But creating life as a rule, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't touch that with a pole. Not human cognizant on a par with human life, no. After all, the animate spell can be used. Uh, any of the spells as written in the book can be altered and, and, and slightly repurposed up to the, per, up to the uh, perception or permission of the DM of the campaign. I've told a you know, story before that my, I, my campaign must have had eight variations on the fireball from lighting a trash can to a fireball. Different purposes. You can always, you know, with with study and expenditure and yada, 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 you can always modify. Uh, and the magician who chanted dragon teeth to sprout into the warriors cast upon the ground was a uh, wonderful Harry, Harris, Harry Harryhausen uh, sequence of a myth from Greek mythology. So, I don't pretend that we deal in mythology per se when we're adventuring. All right, some criticisms. The new camera angle gives you massive hands when gesticulating. You mean, you mean like that? Uh, and it fish eyes me a bit. Well, <laughs> you're working with these eyes. Fish eyes are probably an improvement. And I miss the days of the bookshelf and the distant glow of your fish tank. Yeah, well, I don't. Um, though, it may be after we do some other upgrades that I may take this thing down, clean up the bookcase, and go back to a more natural-looking background. Haven't decided. Um... And then there was a shout out to New Zealand because I said something about New Zealand. Oh, probably about the Duck Quest rules. And um, by the way, having massive hands isn't a silly bad thing. Okay. Hope you had fun at Texas. Yes, gonna tell you all about that in a while. Which monsters mine and create things for themselves? Do you have a list of monsters that make their own armor and weapons? Does their creativity extend into making jewelry and magic items? Subsequent question, what sort of magic items might a monster make? Okay. Now we're going to deal with one of the more problematic uh, words and bits, a bit of semantics that has plagued D&D &D from the very beginning, and that is the word monster. In its original purest form, monsters were anything that weren't the player characters or the NPCs or their ponies, you know, right? Monsters were everything else 
They were potentially hostile and full of teeth and claws. They could be other humans encountered because the encounter charts don't specify. So if we take that broad definition as applies to D&D, &D, monsters are everything except the PCs and the NPCs that they interact with, employ, etc. So that being the criteria, any of the intelligent races are capable of creating any of that stuff. In my world, gnomes are the master artificers. They make the intricate mechanisms and the fine jewelry and such. Um, dwarves, any dwarf that's not a player character, obviously make, they, they melt and smelt and forge their own weapons and armor. Even orcs or goblins are capable of making weapons for themselves, crude perhaps, and prone to snap or, you know, whatever. But um, then there are that class or that section of monsters that don't manipulate tools. So I guess my, my answer would be anything that isn't a player character or a non-player character that is able to manipulate tools beyond poking a stick in a coconut to get the termites out, actual tools able to forge or shape metal could make any of that. Now, wouldn't we all love to be attacked by a horde of orcs all bearing copper weapons or even bronze weapons? because our good iron and steel weapons would make short work of them. Jewelry? Sure. Uh, jewelry to order? Sure. Why not? Gnomes, dwarves, um, any of the races that have stories about them being clever and crafty and good with their fingers and hands, Ought to be a, um, ought to answer your question. And what would they make? Well, it, what type of magic would they make? Um, that again would depend upon the maker, the locale. Now, does if, for instance. I were to put a plus three axe in a game. I would not make the axe plus three because it was magic. I would make it plus three because it was so well made. Any item could be enchanted. It just depends on finding someone capable of performing the enchantment. We know that from lore that there are probably uh, dabblers in the arts among the dwarves, but then there's other lore that said they abhorred that. So in my world, you don't find too many magical items of dwarven manufacture. Just a quirk of my dwarves. But any, any sentient race capable of working the tools needed that has Practice, practitioners of magic could produce magical items. The how and the why and the wherefore, I leave that to you in your campaign. You can justify it any way you want. You can have magic giant black, black ants that poop out swords if that's your bit because they fed them. I don't care. You, understand, you get where I'm going for. Um, how important is it to have magic in your games. Not all that much anymore. Keep in mind that I don't write a, I don't run a campaign. I run repeated adventures, particularly at the cons. I run the Wheel of Blame. Now the Wheel of Blame is D&D. &D. 
and I'll explain that in a, minute, in a little bit more in detail for those of you who might <laughs> be new viewers. Should there be magic in a campaign? Well, hell yeah, it's D&D. &D. It's fantasy. Of course there should be. Whether it's a magical key that'll open every door, or a magical crown, or, you know, or whatever, I find that magic is an integral part of fantasy. That doesn't mean there's got to be a lot. When you have fewer items that have been magic then I can justify him being more special and more powerful. But when you got three hedge wizards turning out plus one swords uh, in the smithy out back, well, it's a different ball game. Excuse me, got to keep it lubricated. Um, now in my wheel of blame, there's fighters, a cleric. Now it's old school. So one of the fighters has some, some serious thief skills. And um, the, I don't use a magic user in the Wheel of Blame. Mm, probably because of the nature of the structure of how the adventures are, are conceived and run. And the fact that, and I'm not against this. But the fact that magic users have to pick in advance. So I've explained before, my clerics aren't limited in that way. But magic users are. And it would be so easy for me, as I'm formulating each encounter, to give them all magic vests, you know, bulletproof vests or... So if there is no magic, I don't worry about magicking around these things. The players have to think. And they have to do some scuffling and fighting and they have you know. But um again if I you know, if I was writing a, a, a big well, well there's some magic, you know, of course, in Curse of the Weaver Queen, which I am assured will be out in, in within a few weeks. Um and uh, there's some magic in there, certainly. And her whole condition is based on magic. And there's a whole set of grimoires in there, that or grimoires, or however you pronounce it, that can be consulted and things done with. So that, in that instance, in that setting, is very important to the story. Because that's the way I wrote it. Now, in the Snake Riders of the Arredondo, they are, um, there are things that, barring any better description, will be considered magic, without giving away anything, because you should go buy it. Um, someone someone requir replied to my uh, uh, comment on the idiots with all that... Uh, Axles and tires and wheels underneath the rusted junk. Um, well, this individual says they're from rural Oregon and maybe a lot of other places with adverse terrain. Okay. Except these are in Cincinnati on paved streets, at least an hour away from anywhere where you can go out and run up and down hills without either getting shot at by the homeowner that you didn't get permission from or uh, chased off or arrested, there are some hill climbing facilities around this area. Mud pits, gravel pits. Okay. Please regale us with, the ta with tales of your re recent Texas con adventure. Did the organizers do anything special for you as it was your last foreseeable expedition? What was the atmosphere like? Did you behave differently from usual? Stay up later, linger longer, make extra excursions to favorite eating places? <laughs> yeah, I wish. What was the best interaction you had? How do you feel about the whole thing now it's over? Well, 
I'm not going to that con or to Total Confusion con anymore because my body simply just does not care to fly. Uh, for whatever reason, uh, driving to the other two cons that I do hope to continue going to, and I'm going to be a game hole because my games have been submitted and accepted. Um, I don't know what it is. It's, I'm sure it's partly psychological as well. Um, who knows and what goes on in my head. So, yeah, I'm real sorry about that. I really am because the, the best part that I used to love about Texas was the ratio of industry people to attendees. Doug used to go out of his way to have just so many people from the industry there. And the beauty of that was that we got to, we industry people got to reconnect with each other during our down times. We weren't doing something and they weren't doing, yeah, and sit down at their table or what, sit down at a table or whatever and just catch up. That was always a very, very important part of Texas for me. Pardon me. Doug was a big part of Texas for me. Doug Ray, who put it on, who started it, who funded it, who uh, spent out of his own pocket to keep it going, in the early, especially in the early days, and built it into an amazing, wonderfully fun convention. So, yeah, I'm sad I'm not going, uh, going to another one. Um, you know, and I'll clarify again, you know, what, what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to do anything that I'm doing now. However, if someone on the left coast approached me, put me a, you know, don't fly me, don't put me in a middle seat, put me in business or better, a nice hotel, and some expense money, some per diem money, okay, I might be bought. Now, Texas can't afford to do that, nor would I expect them to. And I'm not trying to extort anything. Um, yeah, there were some special things. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, Let's talk about the weather. <laughs> Usually when you go down to Texas in the first week of June, it's just hotter than the plains of Tartarus, and you just sweat your ass off. So, I took mostly shorts, a single pair of trousers, nothing with long sleeves. A very unseasonable well, a huge storm system came through, dropped it down into the low to mid 70s the next day. And it was, humidity was unbelievable. Water sat in the low spots in the parking lot for three days. But it never got really hot. However, inside the hotel didn't know that. I don't know how Texans do this. I got to my hotel, Cheryl and I checked in, got to the room, and it was 63 degrees in the room. It took seven hours to get it to 71. And that's having set it at 76. The hotel, as a rule, was like a giant meat locker to anybody running around with shorts and short sleeve shirts on or whatever, um, should know better, yeah, ha, uh -huh, ha, uh ha. -huh. But I've been to Texas so many times and just sweat my fanny off that I no longer take a long sleeve shirt in case I wish I had. It was cold. I found myself going out whenever I could not to consume nicotine or any other inhalable substances, but to play like a turtle and warm up in the sun. It was cold. I mean to tell you, inside that building was cold. And 
thank God I had one pair of jeans. I ended up wearing them the last two days um, just because I was tired of freezing. So, um, excursions to favorite eating places? Nope. No. Though, kudos to the con, they had food trucks. I understand they also had them the year before when I attended um, electronically the year after the pandemic. And they had them again this year. And I only saw two, but they were both quite good. One was called a brunch truck. Shout out to them. They had the, oh man, they had these five inch pickles this big around. Oh my God, they were good. Just bite it off and eat it like an apple. And uh, my uh, fragile digestive system was able to keep uh, most of, well, I could handle roughly the grilled cheese sandwich and the pickle. They also had an outstanding Mexican food truck there. But um, while everybody else was raving about it, I said, okay, fine. I was not ready to risk that and uh, set off a chain reaction. So um, I've never had any. In, in the present location, I've never had any favorite restaurants. Now, when we were back in the place before, there was a place down the block you could walk to that I like to go. I can't remember the name of it. It was a, submarine, a hot sandwich submarine type shop, and it was good. Um, did I behave differently from usual? Well, other than shivering a lot, no. Um, stay up later? Well, I generally stay up till 2 a.m. at cons anyway, because I never have games before 1. Um, <laughs> with, a few, with a few advantages of age and seniority at cons. Linger longer? No, too ill. Make, no, no extra excursions, but uh, certainly we. I spent a, lot, a great deal of time out in the communal smoking areas, making new friends, meeting old friends, consuming smokables. The best interaction that I had. Hmm. Probably. Um, Running into probably, I have several friends that I'm always glad to see. Diesel, um, Chris, Clark, the uh, independent publishers guys, Telanium and Wampler and Green, and um, oh, I, I know I'm forgetting somebody, I apologize. Um, I'm always glad to see them. But I, I'm, I'm especially glad to see Darlene because we go back so far together and we have been friends all that time um, such great friends that when my daughter was born she designed a custom birth announcement for us and calligraphy and everything and it was gorgeous and we mailed it out and uh, people just went crazy over it but that's not why we're friends we're friends because we go back a long long way um, how do I feel about now it's over I'm going to miss it I'm going to miss all the Texas friends. Some of them once in a while. There, there are several people down there that are really leaning toward checking out Game Hole. And, I, and of course, I've encouraged that. There's a few of them down there that have been to Gary Con, will come, but not every year, because that's quite an investment uh, from Texas to Wisconsin. Airplane tickets are not cheap. And you can't fly directly into Lake Geneva. you got to go into Milwaukee or Rockford or Chicago and then bus, tram, you know, whatever. Um, there was something special I was totally unaware of. Apparently, Doug and Mike and some of the other um, people, that John, that have been working on this con for years, had been talking about, talking about setting up some sort of Hall of Fame recognition, honor thing. And then Doug passed. So the survivor said, yes, now we're going to do it. So the North Texas role-playing game convention has a Hall of Fame. The initial, and each year, one person will be selected. However, this first year, there was an induction class of five. Doug, obviously, 
the guy that made all this happen with his vision and his doggedness and his tenacity. He was in there. Janelle Jacques was in there in that class because Janelle has done all the logos on the fronts of the shirts and, and a lot of that stuff, every, a new one every year. And uh, Matt Finch from Swords and Wizardry and, and uh, he's been to everyone. And uh, Bunny Burroughs, otherwise known by his real name as Dennis Astari, the Bunnies and Burroughs uh, author and his work is widely recognized as we've woven its way in through. And the fifth one was myself, and I was very honored and very glad that I wasn't there when it was announced because those things just embarrass the hell out of me when everybody in the room, you know. Thank you. Thank you for the honor. Yes, I participated in every one of them, as has Janelle, as has Matt. I think Dennis has also, and of course Doug was, Doug was the driving force. So uh, that was very special, kind of a nice way to bow out. Um, having said that, it was a great con. I had five games that were full of eager players, I would say probably in the five, in my games, I generally aim for seven, figuring I'll get a no-show because they ran over, they couldn't make it, whatever. Um, I had an eight because a dear friend dropped by and said, Chair, here's a character, sit down. I had uh, two sevens and two sixes. So I had a lot of, a lot of people had a lot of, a lot of fun at my table. Um, this past weekend, um, great time, enthusiastic, eager players, and we had a lot of laughs, and uh, that's why we're there, isn't it, to have fun, and that's why I do it. I, I, I still do it online. If you put together a party of four to seven players, get a hold of me. We'll set it up on Zoom. I have a, access to a commercial Zoom account of a unlimited number of people attending an unlimited length. And uh, I, saw, I charge 75 bucks, um, and I'll uh, send you the pre-gens and all the thing you need to know before you play, and we'll play online sometime. I've done it many times. I'm doing it for the guys in Okinawa again in two, roughly a week and a half from now. On June 19th, I'm going to be doing it for them again. So um, I do those things. If you're not a subscriber to this, this channel, please do. And yes, I have a Patreon now. I published it on my Facebook page earlier today. And there should be a link. <laughs> Hear that video guy? Link, 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 hint, hint. Uh, there should be a link at the end of this. There's three levels. $3 says, hey, Tim, you having a good time? Here's a little something towards your a better camera. Then there's the $9 level. And the $9 level um, gets you um, uh, your name read on air and a thank you from the bottom of my cold black heart. And then there's a higher level. It's 20 or 25 and these are monthly, by the way, uh, as I understand it. And then there's a the high one that uh, would get you a link to two videos a month that are not put together nice, not edited just at all, and it's just uh, the curmudgeon unfiltered about whatever strikes my fancy. Inside gaming, outside gaming, quirks of the personalities, stuff that's going on in the world, whatever. And um, it might not be suitable for the workplace. Never know. So anyway, that's, that's my Patreon. Now, it's coming to my attention that I'm getting fewer and fewer comments. 
I don't believe I'm getting boring because my viewership is steadily rising. So there's got to be questions that you like an opinion on because that's what I do. I give opinions in my in my humble fashion. I give suggestions or I say this is how I do it. I very seldom knock something. But the curmudgeon unfiltered or curmudgeon unplugged, whatever we decide to can't, that won't be the case. So if you got a question, if you got a comment about something that's going on in gaming that you like, you don't like, whatever, put it in a comment after this. This is where I get this is where I get my script, such as it is, for the next one. So ask. And hey, I, I'm a big minis player. I'm a board player. Now, God knows there's enough board games that I haven't played. And if you write a board game question and I don't even mention it, it means beats me. Which is just a, a, a simple... I don't know enough about it to feel qualified to give any kind of answer, opinion, or otherwise. Um, aspects of, of board gaming and crappy rules and too many dice, not, you know, whatever. Gaming. Gaming is my game. Gaming. I started out a board gamer, became a minis gamer, then discovered role play. So, yeah, I got... Oh, Lord. How long ago? Whew. I got it almost 60 years of playing experience now. Boy, that's a scary... It, it is 60. That's a scary thought. And on that scary thought, I think I'll... Uh, bug out and say, da 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 go -bee. Quite the feller, the curmudgeon in the cellar. 